today looks a, a real new day in Bamburi. And with what you can see, we are setting standards for graduation. So I take this time to really congratulate the class of 2024. You have raised our standards. They have made us look like this, you know? So we are glad and we celebrate with this team. Uh, I have seen what kind of talents we have in our house. We have great mobilizers. And I would really urge, you know, the rest of us, please, let's have our eyes open. Catch the vision and learn with it. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, um, the month of September has been the month to, <coughs> to do an exposition on the book of Second Peter. You know, in my own Bible reading, I had not looked at the letters of Peter the way I've done these last two weeks. And I can see there is a lot of wealth we get from them. And the idea of doing an ex exposition on it is great. So we started on chapter one last week, and we dealt with uh, <coughs> the urge by Peter, urging the, his, uh, his listeners to be diligent in building up the faith we received from the Lord Jesus from the time we got saved. And we were to do that with diligence. We keep adding it. We dis, uh, with the decisive commitment, not just expecting things to happen on their own. We ought to put our own effort to see that we grow on the faith that Christ gave us as the point of salvation. Today we continue from verse 12 uh, up to 15. And I would like us to read 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12 to 15. And Peter says, For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things. Though you know and are established in the present truth. You know them, but I will not be negligent to keep reminding you. Amen? Verse 13. Yes, I think it is right, as long as I am in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you. Hallelujah. Diligence in stirring us up was with Peter uh, when he was writing this. And the urgency was such that it's like he, he had an awareness that his time to go, to go where people go and don't come back. You know, his time to go was coming near. And therefore, verse 14, he says, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. And verse 15. Moreover, I'll be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease or after my departure. How many times is Peter reminding us? Did you count? Did you count how many times? Oh, three times. In verse 12, he says, for this reason, I will not be uh, negligent to remind you. In verse 13, I think it is right as long as I am in this tent to stir you up by reminding you. And verse 15, moreover, I'll be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after I am gone. 
Now, after the, uh, admonishing Christians to be diligent and to make effort to grow in their faith, Peter is now emphasizing on them to remember. He is being diligent himself to remind Christians on the importance to continually keep growing in the grace and knowledge of God. At this time, the churches of Asia Minor were not just struggling with the persecution and suffering as Peter addressed in his first letter, they also had strife and dissensions within their lungs. Note that when Peter was writing this letter, he was in Rome, and it's likely that he had been arrested or he was in prison. And therefore, he was writing to his, uh, to his church back in Jerusalem, and the churches are out there in Asia Minor. So in an effort to stem the tide of hearsay and false teachings among the Christians, Peter emphasized the importance of learning and clinging to the proper knowledge of God. The grace of God in Christ transforms and empowers Christians to live righteously, even in the face of opposition. But then, I asked myself, why is Peter so careful to remind Christians about the truth of the gospel? About being diligent with their faith? About working their salvation as they grow? Why? Why is it so important? Yeah, this is because that Normally, there is the danger of falling back. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, he warned against complacency three times concerning this truth. We need to be regularly reminded about our spiritual intensity and the need to make every effort and increase in our faith. Peter's admonition teaches us that we need reminders. We need uh, evangelists to teach us. We need teachers to remind us on how to improve and grow. We need our fellow Christians who see our lives and remind us of how to act godly and righteously. We need to remind one another. We need to remind even ourselves lest we forget. Amen? So Peter is reminding us uh, in this way so that we will be able to continue to be reminded even after he is gone. He knew he was about to die. And in African culture, when an elderly person, because we saw Peter was uh, about 100 years old when he was writing these letters, isn't it? So he was quite elderly, and he's about to die. And the things he's considering to be important to remind Christians are about the fact of their growth in their walk with Christ. Now, Bamburi, you are Africans. And to Peter, you are Gentiles. And when an old man is about to die, and he tells you something, what ought you to do? You're supposed to take them seriously, isn't it? So we need to get a second thought over what Peter is telling us. Now, verse 14, he says that our Lord Jesus had made it clear to him that uh, he was about to pass away. Now, he could be referring to a special revelation. Maybe Peter had had a, a revelation where Jesus, uh, you know, uh, told him, you know, prepare yourself. Time is about. Or Jesus could even have told him verbally, uh, you know, in an encounter with him. But 
we read about, uh, and we have witnessed that the Holy Spirit would tell people about things to come those days. And maybe Peter had had such an encounter. So he knew that he, his time had come, you know. But probably also, uh, Peter is talking about his uh, departure following another encounter Peter had, had with Jesus. You remember the time Jesus had died and uh, he was buried and of course on the third day he arose. But at that time the disciples had been very discouraged in that some of them, including Peter, had, go, had gone back to their normal way of life. Remember, before Peter was called by Jesus, he was a fisherman with his friends. And after Jesus had died, because of the great discouragement they had, they left and went fishing. And one of the days when they were fishing, Jesus appeared to them. Uh, and I think it was a morning and during that time, Jesus had some discussion with Peter. We find it in John 21, uh, verse 18 to 19, where Jesus told Peter, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, uh, you will stretch your, out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. Verse 19. This he said to show or to signify by what kind of death Peter was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Uh, this was the second time Jesus was telling Simon Peter, follow me. After he had resurrected. Now, Jesus told Peter that there would be that time where he would be taken where he does not want to go. When, and, and when that happens, it will signify that his time to die was around the corner. And I think this is what Peter is mentioning here when he's writing his letter. Therefore, Peter is writing this so that they would be able to consult and revisit his teachings. We see why God's words are written down for us. The purpose is that we would go back to these words and run from them. And that's what we are doing this morning. So the intent is that we would remind ourselves about what we need to do. The apostles were not going to live forever yet. They were receiving the very words of God through the Holy Spirit. They wrote these words of God through the Holy Spirit so that we could recall these things at any time. And probably it's also a, a good time to run that even us, as we serve God, as we grow in our walk with the Lord, as we experience the Lord, maybe perhaps we also need to write our story. Have you read about autobiographies of some, especially believers? Have you read some? Did they encourage you? Yeah, perhaps. Maybe you now wait to read yours. Yeah? May the Lord give you the grace to write. I think putting down uh, things down in record is very important so that we don't forget. Human beings have the capacity and capability of forgetting. You remember the Israelites? How God performed miracles for them in Egypt? How the Lord performed miracles for them as they crossed the Red Sea? You remember these things? God provided water even from a rock. Times would come and they would forget what the Lord had done for them. And they would grumble. Eventually, Everybody that left Egypt died in the wilderness, except two people, right? And the two people had a different testimony from the majority of the others. 
Because when they went to spy the land, they saw giants there who are very big compared to, to the Israelites. They came back with a positive report that, that there may be giants there, but our God is able to help us conquer them. So those two, because they could remember the works of God in the past, were able to remain and see the promised land as we know it. So Peter is very passionate to remind Christians, do not forget the works the Lord have done for you in your life. From the time you received the gift of faith, do not forget how far the Lord has brought you. The many things God has taught you, the many things you have observed, witnessed the Lord doing, do not forget. Why should you not forget? So that your faith should not run cold. Our faith must remain alive. Amen? And therefore we must stir up one another. Peter is saying in verse 13 that uh, I am writing this so that I can stir you up. Okay? That yes, I think it is right as long as I am in this tent to stir you up by reminding you. And this morning, uh, I just want us to remind one another that we may stir ourselves up. Even as our graduates graduate today, please remember the path you have come from, the lessons you learned, you know, those discussions you used to have, the way you are passionate, remember them. So that after here, your faith will grow. After here, you'll be able to serve the Lord with a passion. Amen? And I have witnessed a lot of passion in this group. So, Bamburi, watch this space. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Now, uh, overall, we need to constantly be aroused to our Christian duties and exhorted to keep our eyes upon Christ because we encounter so many distractions. We need to be, uh, rather, to inspire the church's zeal and devotion to Christ. To accomplish this, we need to remind ourselves of these things namely our calling, and to develop and read a godly life. We need to stir ourselves up because there are dangers of spiritual stagnation. And uh, <clears throat> in, uh, to help us against spiritual stagnation, we need to occasionally do some spiritual checkups. Like one of the checkups we ought to do is, do I thirst for God? You remember the time you gave your life to Christ? Did you remember the way you used to have an appetite for the word of God? Did you remember the way you used to be passionate about prayer? Okay. Has it remained? Is it the same? It, is it the same way even today? The tendency to, to stagnate is usually high because of the many distractions we face in life. And therefore, we need to regularly do a checkup. How is our thirst for God? Another one is, am I governed increasingly by God's word? How often do you take time and get that time? We call it quiet time. You get that space where you can study the word of God, you know, and see what the Lord is telling you on a daily basis. I must admit, I've always not done that, though I've taught my students to do that. But these, two, these last two weeks, this matter has been awakened in me. I've had to study the book of Second Peter. And I would urge us 
to regularly find time and study the word. Have that quiet time so that the Lord can continually inspire us through, through his word. After all, faith comes by hearing and by the hearing of the word of and as we, uh, as we learn in class, the retention of the word of God, you know, because we can hear the word of God as you are hearing now, or you can see it on TV, but the retention, uh, the great part of retaining the word of God is when you study and memorize. You remember that? Study and memorize and meditate. And that we do well when we do it at our quiet place. Number three, am I more loving today than when I first believed? Is the love of Christ still rife in our hearts? In the book of Revelation, John is telling the church, uh, I think it was the church of Ephesus, I'm a, it's one of those churches that I know your works. You, you don't like corruption. You also try hard not to lie. Yeah? You don't steal. Passe. But I have one thing against you. That you have left your first love. So we have to regularly keep checking. Am I loving? Am I, more, am I growing in my area of love? Even as you diligently add to the faith that you are given at the point you got saved. Am I sensitive to God's presence and to God's reading? When you are making decisions, perhaps some of them major decisions in your life, are you sensitive to the reading of God's word, to the reading of God? You know, when probably you are, I heard Maggie says she wants more of this, you know. So when you make decisions of spouse and who to get married to, are you involving the Lord? Are you arrived to the reading of the Holy Spirit? Another area to check is, do I have a growing concern for the needs of others? Do I? I'm a, maybe the needs is there, but probably not a big, big deal. But I want to appreciate that uh, members in Bamburi, you try. You try. When others have difficulties, I have seen Bamburi people come together and help. And I think on this one, I can give a tick for many, many of us. Keep it up. Hallelujah. Keep it up. It pleases the Lord when we, we grow uh, our concern towards the need of others. Another one. Do I delight in the church? You know, Jesus refers to the church as his bride. He loves the church. He delights in the church. But do I? Do you? And in Baburi again, I have seen, uh, you know, I have seen the love for the church. And if you want to know, come here on a Saturday morning. Unaona watu anajituma to make sure that this place looks good. And this is an area I think we need more people. Kwa hivi otafadhali. Horoda uh, Kamkutano with yourself and consider. There is a group of members, they call themselves Sanctuary Keepers. You can join them and find the joy there is in serving the Lord in his house. So the habits uh, are habits of faith increasing, uh, increasingly important to me. Studying God's word, as we have already mentioned, prayer, corporate worship. Is the area of corporate worship growing in you, Bamburi? Ask me 
Because when I come on Tuesday, <laughs> when I come on Tuesday, okay, today we are full here, but when we come on Tuesday, like this last Tuesday, my friend, this area, eh? Eh? this area of corporate worship, we need, we need to stir ourselves up. True or false? Yes. I really look forward when on Tuesday we'll be like this. And, and we'll be squeezing ourselves looking for the corner to pray. Because everybody is there. You know? We are supposed to grow in the habits of prayer. Another one. Do I grieve over sin? Does my sin bother me? Okay? My dishonesty. Does it bother me? You know, sometimes we can become uh, complacent on the area of sin. Sensitivity to sin. When you fail, when you sin, how sensitive are you to make it right? Of course, the scripture tells us that um, if we say we have not sinned, we deny ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But God is faithful and just. Because when we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So do you grieve of our sin? If you find that there is no grief, it does not pain you when you realize you have sinned, then you need to stir yourself up. The sensitivity to sin need to remain and even be more, more sensitive. Okay? So that we can arrive, our, we can remain in tune with the Lord because sin comes to disconnect us from the Lord. And yet he has provided a solution to it. And that solution is confession. So we need to do regular checks on our faith so that we don't fall back, you know, uh, on the great uh, faith that we were given at the point of believing. Another check is, am I a quick forgiver? When somebody wrongs me, do I tend to hold a grudge? Am I slow to forgive because of my pride? How dare they do that to me? Don't they know who I am? Yeah? So how quick are you to forgive? And then another one is, do I long for heaven and the presence of Jesus? Or is my grip on the things of this world so tight that I never think of being present with Christ? Or are you one of the people who would say, watcha, watcha yesu agoje kidogo? I just got a car, and CJ, I didn't, I have not yet, <laughs> you know. Or I just got married, <laughs> and I have not, oh, I'm, I'm yet to get married. So, yes, please, hold on. But, um, okay, Jesus is not coming as quickly as we expect, for as long as we are not spreading the word of God. But our desire to be with him need to be growing. Okay? So these are checks to help us know how sensitive are we. So why have I become stagnant in my spiritual journey? In, uh, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13, Paul says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with the fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pressure. Amen? Yeah, God works in us. So we need to work in collaboration with God. We make effort, and God also works in us. 
another, uh, another other scripture that reminds us of our, <coughs> our walk with God is Isaiah 46 verse 9. Isaiah said, or rather God is telling the Israelites, remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. God is interested that we don't forget him and his, the works he has done for us. Deuteronomy 6.12, he also addressed the Israelites and he told them, then take care, rest, you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. So something else we need to check on in our spiritual uh, in our effort to start ourselves, is that there is something called prideful self-sufficiency. We sometimes think that spiritual growth is all our own doing. And the easiest way to spot prideful self-sufficient in yourself is to examine your prayer life. Self-sufficient people tend to struggle with the quietness and the stillness of prayer. They think, when I pray, I am not doing anything. To them, prayer feels like a waste of time. It seems too passive. You know, sometimes, you know, uh, people can be so blessed in their service to God that uh, they may tend to think that it all depends on their personal effort. And this one we need to take as a caution. When the Lord blesses you and you go do exploit for the Lord, do not forget the place of prayer. That after you have done all the exploits, when you retire, get your time with the Lord so that you can have another inspiration for the next day. Let's not be so successful and forget the place and connection of the Lord. That's caution. But there is also something else called passive spirituality. We sometimes think that spiritual growth is all God's doing. I'll just wait patiently for you to work. I'll just trust Again, uh, <clears throat> just sitting back for God to do everything, you'll be failing on our diligence. Because Peter is telling us, be diligent in building up your faith. But at the same time, our efforts can't serve us anything without the Lord. So we need to strike a balance somewhere. So the prideful person tends layerly to pray. A prideful person will rarely pray. But then the passive person tends to merely pray. You just pray and don't do anything about it. But the point is this. When is the last time you studied the scripture? Faith comes by hearing and the hearing of the word of God. What diligence are you putting towards your prayer life? When is the last time you talked to your unbelieving friend about Jesus, for example? Passive spirituality will answer, Oh, I don't do that. But I am praying for someone to share Christ with my friend. I am trusting God. And then ask you, really? You are trusting God that somebody else will talk with your friend about Christ? Really? Then what effort are you making for that someone to come to meet your friend so that he can share with him about Christ? Are we together? Yes. So if you want your friend to know Christ, do something about it. Share the, your experience. That's one. If you can't, 
then arrange that somebody else will come. Because at the end of the day, the soul of your friend will be required from you. That's what the scriptures say. So we must make effort, even as we are praying. We don't just hide under prayer and do nothing on our part. So the way forward, there's something called dependent discipline. So pride, prideful self-sufficient and passive spirituality both produce the same result, which is stagnation and frustration. But uh, the way forward is we must realize that spiritual growth is not all our doing, nor is it all God's doing. It involves a collaboration between us and God. It involves submitting to God, cooperating with him, participating in his plan, and then we move forward in the journey of spiritual formation, not by handling everything ourselves, nor by handing everything over to God, but by displaying dependent discipline. Amen? So the way forward is the way to spirit-empowered human effort. We strive with the strength God provides. Kidogo. So our vigorous pursuit is anchored firmly in God's power. As Paul puts it, we work out and God works within. Uh, there are, there's an example here we can uh, look at. Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 9. Rather, chapter 4, verse 9. Nehemiah, when he was doing the wall of Jerusalem, in verse 9 he says, And we prayed to our God and set a guard as a protection against them day and night. Nehemiah's task was to read God's people to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. This was a considerable challenge. And at this point in the story, Nehemiah is anticipating being attacked. Remember, they used to receive threats from the enemies. And how did he respond? He prayed and set a guard. Nehemiah did not leave God out of the equation. He did not act as if everything depended on him, himself as Nehemiah. Nor did he pray with a passive spirituality that he refuses to plan and work. He prayed and set a guard. He prayed for peace, and he prepared for war. And we know that they succeeded. Isn't it? Yeah, so we need to combine dependence on God and our effort to follow what God is guiding us. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 7, Paul says to his colleague Timothy, Think of what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. The question is, should Timothy study, meditate, and concentrate, or will God give Timothy the gift of understanding? The answer is both. Uh, <clears throat> because uh, he will, Timothy uh, will need his intellect and his brilliance, and also will depend on God to guide him. So we need to think deeply, and then roll up the strips of our mind, and rely on the Lord to give us the understanding in everything. In conclusion, there is a scripture, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6 to 7. Therefore, Paul says to Timothy, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my, of my hands. For God does not give us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. 
So there is a responsibility for styling up what we already have. Amen? God expects us to put an effort to it. And when we do, he blesses us and raises up to another level. I came across some, some bits of history of revival times over, over the years, over time. Now, I noted the brethren from England who brought the fire from Azusa Street Revival. There's a street revival called Azusa Street. They had gathered every day under the terrible cold. Their only prayer topic was, Lord, give us men that will spread your fire in the streets of England. Did you hear that? They put personal effort to go to the streets in the cold, asking the Lord to bring fire. And the Lord did. Uh, look for the story about the Azusa revival. Azusa Street Revival in England. It were people who prayed fervently, and it came. Then I got another one. Uh, uh, during the Indonesian Revival, those hungry hearts were seen praying day and night. And they would say, Lord, the harvest is ripe. If it pleases you, please use us. They were willing to be used. They were not saying, please bring other people. Use us. So one prayer that was common during the days of uh, William Seymour, another revival, uh, another person who started revival was, Lord, this is another day that hell must roast men and women, priests, we are here. Use us. Another effort, Paul said, Oh, it's me if I preach not the gospel. But unfortunately, our churches are filled today with people who are not ashamed of spiritual barrenness. We are asking, God, give me money. God, give me that. Give me a visa, and so forth. Where do we see believers again that will be praying and fasting? And when you listen to them, you will be hearing, Lord, let your fire fall in my community, and let there be revival. How many times do we get the burden to pray for the sterling? and the revival in our times. When Paul encountered Christ, he fell and rose. What he asked was, Lord, what will you have me do? You remember the account uh, of Paul when he was going to persecute the Christians? When he was struck with brightness and he came and Jesus introduced himself, Paul was willing to say, what is it, Lord? that I do. And we know what Paul did after that. But today, when we fall under an anointing, we start expecting uh, various miracles to happen to our own personal benefits. But as we remember the efforts of others, let's take a reflection on the place where we are. And when we consciously desire that we are stirred up, the Lord will do it and cooperate with us. And today, even as we celebrate the graduation of our graduates for membership classes, I have a prayer that this day can mark the beginning of revival. First, in our own personal hearts, our personal faith and walk with God. Two, 
in our church, in our family church. And that this revival will spread out across our country. And that this revival will also land in, in France. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So let's also make history from our point of desire to excel in our work with the Lord. So that someday they will write and say, in Bamburi, in the year 2024. Hallelujah. Amen. The Lord bless you. Amen.